Well, listen, uh, I'm so excited to have you here. Uh, both of you represent to me not only the greatest of all time in your sports, because you are, but men that have gone through the ringer. You know, the, we live in unique times sure. where celebrities are treated in a very different way than they were, say, 50 years ago. And I know you went through a really rough time. I know you were raised by a single mom and had challenges with your dad. But the way you pulled yourself through that and the way you reconnected with your father, it's fucking inspiring. And thank we you. Uh, respect you and love you, and we all do. We all watched your story thank in you. great detail before we came. Just want to really thank you. Thank you so I just want to know, first of all, um, how is Michael Phelps different today than 2012? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think the biggest thing is is I'm, I'm comfortable with who I am. Mm. You know, I think for so long I really just looked, as, looked at myself as kind of this kid that was a talented swimmer that just went up and down the pool, and I didn't really know who I was as a person. And, and I was to the point in my life where I didn't like who I saw in the mirror, and, and um, I, you know, super ADD, so I'm always bouncing off the wall and have a ton of energy and kind of can't get me to shut up from time. So I always thought people were judging me and, and looking at me differently. And finally, after um, my most recent downfall in 2014, I just decided that the world is going to show, like, I'm going to show the world who Michael Phelps is. And I wasn't going to care. This is me. And if you didn't like it, it's not my problem. I'm going to yes. be me. And, um, you know, I think that was the coolest part for me, especially in my career and now moving past my career into um, welcoming our second child seven weeks ago. Congratulations. Um, That's awesome. You. That's beautiful. World. Son or daughter? Um, uh, two boys. Two boys. Yeah. That's wonderful. Seven-week-old Beckett, and then Boomer is going to be almost two. That's so, wonderful. How has having a child changed your life? I learned a lot of patience. <laughs> a lot of patience. Uh, and, and for number two, it's a lot different than number one for me because uh, I wasn't there for the first three months, really, of, of Boomer's life. Like, I was in and out. Um, so I didn't really experience the no sleep and this and that that all comes along with it. So now um, that I'm retired, I get to experience all of this. And I think last week was probably the toughest week. I think I averaged about four, four and a half hours every night. So um, it, it, it really tested me uh, towards the end of the week. And, and my son was really pressing a lot of buttons. So it was uh, a learning experience, but it was good. And, and uh it's been super fun. We've loved yeah, it. That's Absolutely really loved beautiful. It. I love seeing the love with you and your wife and seeing how she has stood by you all these times. You know, a lot of people um, bail in those moments, and you could just see that she loves you at a level that's extraordinary, and you deserve that. How much a role has she played in that comeback for you? Um, so Nicole and I have been, I guess this July will be 11 years that we've been on and off. Um, we broke up, up after 08, back together before 12, broke up after 12, got back together before 16, and now I hope third time's a charm. Um, <laughs> but, but the coolest thing, I think, with our relationship is we've just been able to go through absolutely everything together, the good, the bad, the ugly, yes. privately and publicly. Um, and I think that's made us so much stronger. And, and, and also, we've been able to grow with one another and, and just learn with each other how to communicate better and... and um, now with two kids, just, just how to help each other. And, and yeah. it's, it's been the coolest journey for me, just being able to grow with somebody that I love so much and, and that has played a huge, significant role in my life for a long time. Well, let me take you back, if we could, to the very beginning. Your mom, you know, we saw us put you in for safety purposes, yeah. and now you become the greatest athlete <laughs> in the history of the Olympics in that area. Tell me something, like, back in those days, did... Did you just, were you a fish to water? Did they throw you in? Because well, everybody talks about things like, you know, your 6'7 wingspan. wingspan. You didn't have a 6'7 wingspan back then, and you right. still competed. When did you really take to the sport? What made you take to the sport? And at what stage did you say, this is going to be my world? Um, when I was 11 years old, I started swimming with my coach, who I swam with my whole career, named Bob Bowman. And, and uh, he kind of sat down with me when I was 11 and, and said, uh, I started swimming with him when I was nine, and then at 11, he sat down and was like, you can make the Olympic team. And I was wow. like, cool. That would be awesome. Why not? He's like, you could do it in four years. And I was like, okay, let's do it. So I stopped playing baseball, lacrosse, and soccer, focused on swimming, because that's what I had wanted to do. My sister at that point was uh, first in the nation and third in the world um, in 94 um, for swimming, and, and she was 13 or 14 or whatever. And, and um, that was her goal, and I had already, already seen her go to national teams and travel all over the world and see all these cool meets and places and, and experience all this, and I was like, I want to do that. 
I want to be a world record holder. I want to be an Olympic gold medalist. I want to be a professional athlete. That's what I want. Um, and four years later, my coach took me there. I, I don't know what made me trust him right then and there. Um, I actually, like, it's fun for me now because so many more stories come up through yeah. this process. And, and if I look back to that moment when I trusted him at 11, I, I think it was almost really, I was looking for somebody who had confidence in me. Um, and, and, and like a father figure who had confidence in me, and, and he showed that. Um, you know, my father was very absent at that time in my life, and, and uh, my coach stepped in, and, and he just believed that I could do whatever I wanted. And, and, and for me, I was like, all right, cool, like, let's do it. Like, you know, he would say jump, and I would say how high at that point. You know, like, so I, I still remember some of the sets that we did as a kid, and, and um, I mean, it, it's mind-blowing to me now, and, and he just got me to that point, and I said, okay, well, what's next? And Why did you trust him? I, I don't know. I wow. really have no idea. Because you've lived a life where it's hard to trust, right? A lot of times you've been taken advantage of. You've had people that are your friends sure. put pictures all over sure. the freaking world. Sure. Um, so uh, the trust that you built with him, did it grow anywhere else? Uh, I mean, I think the, the, the one real special thing about our relationship and, and why we were able to have the longevity is because we grew together. Mm. We had to grow together because we were spending so much time with one another. So, you know, once we got, you know, when I, I guess when I was 18 years old, we had some struggles because he still saw me as the 11-year-old kid that he once did. And I was like, look, this isn't going to fly. Either we're going to have to change this or I'm never swimming for you again. Um, and, and we had a lot of those kind of head-butting moments, I guess you could call them. Um, and, and we just grew together. And, and we wanted to do absolutely everything we could to be the best that we possibly could. And, and I think that's really what started us. Um, into or brought us into basically from what 2000 or 99 to 05, 99 to 06, basically straight without missing a single day, 365 days a year. And 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 please tell people about your training regimen. I would um, use an example when people <laughs> bitch about training twice a day. Right? <laughs> we so during that time we were averaging about 10 workouts a week, um, seven days a week. Uh, we had doubles three days a week, um, and they were two-hour sessions in the pool, and then we had an hour, hour and a half out of the pool, three times a week, four times a week. Um, but one, I'll share one story because we, we talked about it earlier. We go to Colorado. We, we would go to Colorado Springs to the uh, United States Olympic Training Center, and we would train up there for three weeks, and we would spend um, basically all we did was eat, sleep, swim, and lift. That's all I did. And we would go from 5 to 7, 9 to 11, and 3 to 5, all in the pool, and then have a weight session afterwards. So we're having four workouts a day. So incredible. So over 24 days, we're probably working out with weights 75 times. We probably had 75 workouts in 24 days. So at that point, it was kind of like I, was, I saw myself improving so much because we weren't taking a day off. And, and in the sport of swimming, if you miss one day, it takes you two days to get back to where you were. So we why, had why is that? Just because you lose kind of the feeling for water oh, and okay. your muscles kind of get out of rhythm a little bit. Okay. Um, so is, I'm just curious. Is that true with snowboarding as well? No. <laughs> no. Okay. I'm just curious. <laughs> <laughs> You were, you were on the on the Bosu ball over there, and you're like, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. But that was like, but that was what I wanted, though. So where did that drive come from? I know you wanted to. Lots of people want. There's between you want and fucking unbelievable drive that just you will not stop. You'll do four and five workouts. Whatever well, it takes. well, the biggest thing was was after going to my first Olympics in 2000 when I was 15. Um, I I. I decided to not take a break afterwards and kind of get right back into it because it's the same thing that he was talking about. Yeah. I was upset with my performance. You know, I got fifth and at 15, yeah, it's great, but I mean, let's be honest, I don't want to come back with a fucking participation like ribbon. Like, I want to come back with <laughs> real hardware. Like, I don't want this bullshit <laughs> ribbon. So, I, like, I was pissed about it. So, like, Boom. you know, like, like I, I, that's, that's just what I wanted. So I was like, all right, cool. So we got back in the water the next day. Everyone else took, like, a month or two off. And the, I remember the very first workout we did, as the meet's going on, Bob has WR written on the top of the workout. And I'm like, what, what is this? 
Like, I know what it means, but like, why are you writing it here? And he's like, because we're going to break a world record in six months. I was like, all right. Decide. Yeah, let's do it. Cool. I'm in. Six months later, first world record. Six months after that, broke another one, won my first world championship. And he just started proving to me that he could get me to these certain places. And we just started pressing the envelope even more. We're like, all right, what do we want to do next? How big can we really take this? Yeah. And, and um, you know, I, I remember sitting with my agent when I was 15, 16 years old, and I just said, I want to do something that nobody else has ever done in the sport. Mm. I want to do something different. I don't want to be the second Mark Spitz. I want to be the first Michael Phelps. I want to do something oh, nobody awesome. else has ever done. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, and, and that's honestly really just what drove me. One of um, your competitors said you would never be able to do that. Thorpe. Tell us about Thorpe. Uh, did that drive you? No, uh, Thorpe. He, and he knows. Him and I have spent so much time in the water and so much time competing against one another. And, and For we those know who are not from Australia, you might Ian Thorpe. Uh, Ian Thorpe's one of, arguably one of the greatest swimmers in the world. Um, incredible, incredible competitor. Great guy. Um, and he said in 2008, he said, it's, it's impossible for somebody to win eight gold medals. And I was like, all right, well, wait and see. Um, <laughs> but he actually said uh, in 2016, going into 16, he said, uh, he said no, no, no one over the age of 30 can win an individual swimming Olympic gold. And I was like, all right. So I finally said something to him afterwards. I was like, dude, I was like, you just have no confidence in your boy? He goes, no, I know how your mind works. And I know how much that would give you to help you really kind of Fight, they're kind of fight through it and and watching wow, that like but, watching that 200 fly where yeah. the uh japanese and the hungarian were basically running me down if we had one more meter i wouldn't have won that race so um it, it was good so it, it really did help push me to to get there and, and, wow. and to finish how i needed to how about when you win by one one hundredth of a freaking second Right, like what's going on in your mind there, and how do you do that? I mean, that isn't just skill, that's something in you that just won't be defeated, isn't it? What is it? But I think it's like if you look at the greats, especially in sports, they just know how to get it done at those yeah. moments. You yeah. know, like watching Sean getting ready for his third, I was like, all right, well, he's been here before, like, you know, he knows what to do. It's yeah. kind of like he knows how to get into his, in, into his head and just let happen what needs to happen and, and and that's how it was you know i got into that that moment leading into that that finish and and uh to be honest i thought the half stroke cost me the race i really thought it cost me the race i was like well there goes a gold medal and i hit the wall and i needed that half stroke because i would have done what kavik did and kind of glide into the wall yeah. and almost act as like a speed bump because um, his hands were like this when he was coming into the wall, and his body was shaped in a U. So I hit it with so much force moving directly forward and hit the pad and triggered the pad 100th faster than he did. 100th um, second. They had to go down to the 1,000th um, to find that, uh, the, the, the winner of the race. So, I, yeah, I mean, I've, okay, I've tell, been on... Tell me what you're feeling when you do that and you realize you win, win by 1 100th of a second. I knew I, I, knew I was going to win eight. You did? I knew. I knew the I was going to win. So you visualize it, you yeah. saw it, you felt it. But that's like for me, like I've been doing this since I was probably 12, 13 years old, where I visualize how I want the race to go, how I don't want the race to go, and how the race could go. Just so you get, so you, when you're there in that moment, you're prepared for anything that's around you. And that was something similar. my he coach was talking, did. You were talking about, Sean, that knowing what you're not going to do and yeah. knowing what you're going to do. You have to. Yeah. Where am I going to eat? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You got to know all those little small things. I mean, I heard him say all those little small things ends up, end up adding together to make a massive difference. And, and the more you can kind of get into that rhythm, it, you just don't even have to think about it. It's just so natural and it comes right to you. So that was something I think I was very fortunate to have a coach who taught me so many amazing things at such a young age that yeah. I was able to carry on and, and perfect almost, I yeah. guess, to a point um, throughout my career. Little things are not little. Not, no. not, not, not when no. you're competing at the highest level. <laughs> I mean, everything. Tell me um, when, you know, the, tell me about 2012. Because 2012, you said you're going to uh, retire, you're done. You, you, looked, you made it very clear you were done. Everybody thought you were done. Tell us what happened, because I know that was a low point. And I, yeah. But part of the power of who you are is you made it through that shit, you yeah. know, where you're literally questioning whether we want to live or not. Sure. Will you share a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so basically, after 2008, I, I kind of. Um, half-assed it for about two years. I didn't really try. I didn't train. I didn't care. It, it really felt like it was, it was a chore. Everything that I was doing was a chore, and I hated it. I couldn't wait until 2012 was over. I wanted to get through the Olympics. I wanted nothing to do with swimming. And 
going into like the 2011 World Championships, I, I kind of decided that I needed to start working um, because it was going to be kind of challenging for me to try to do what I wanted to do without any work. Um, and, and you heard it in that interview that I did with Matt. I mean, I literally went a week or two without coming to practice and I knew I had an interview with him and I showed up that day. And he didn't know that I had been gone for this whole time. I just put on this great front that I, could, I was really good at doing. Um, and I was like, I didn't care, Matt. I didn't want to be around the sport. I just wanted to finish. So um, for me, one of the races you saw is one of my least favorite races in my entire career. Um, but it's also one of probably the most influential races in my career. Um, you know, going to 2012, I wanted to win the 200 fly. It was one race, one race I really wanted to win. And, and um, I went almost three years without watching that race um, because it really pissed me off. And because I knew I screwed it up by not preparing myself the best way that I knew how to, to give, my chance, to give myself the chance and the right opportunity to win the race. Um, so when I got second by a tenth, um, I was like, great, I'm done. See you later. Finished. And I went on my own way. And, you know, six months later, I was 35, 40 pounds overweight and in a really bad place. And it just kept going deeper and deeper and deeper. And, and you know, I got to the point where um, I decided that I wanted to come back. And, and in the beginning, I, I really deeply wanted to come back, but I don't think I fully wanted to come back. I, th I think I knew I wanted to because I wanted another chance to be able to, to finish my career how I wanted to. And as you heard, hang my suit up exactly how I want. Um, I don't want to have a what if 20 years down the road. And, and you know, for me, going through that low point where I didn't want to be alive, um, I think really opened my eyes up to, to a lot. Um, and, and, what was it, and what was it? I know there was issues with your father that, that had been in you for some time. Sure. But for one of the reasons I really wanted you to share, I'm so grateful you are, is so many people get depressed and they, they feel humiliated and embarrassed sure. because they're a strong person. Right. You're about as strong as a human being can be. Right. What was it that made you get into that place? And what happened when you went through the meadows and therapy that got you out of it so you got hungry again? Um, I mean, and, and this, this wasn't the first time I had gone through a state of depression. Um, I mean, I went through one after 2004, after 08, definitely after 12 and, and 14. And then... And what um, would be the cause? What would trigger you? Uh, honestly, I have a really hard time believing that, that the USOC and other NGBs can't support us coming off of such a high like the Olympic Games because, you know, you work for four years to get to this point and such a high, you know, mental, physical, emotionally draining experience and, and um, you go through it and then you come off of it and you're like, all right, cool, now what? You're almost lost because yeah. you, you're, you just have no idea where to go. And it's, it, it pisses me off so much that... that um, the people who are in charge of our Olympic committee, in my opinion, I don't think they care. Um, well, maybe they don't even understand. I notice you kind of have a response to that too. I'm just blowing my mind. <laughs> yeah, I've been depressed after every single Olympic. But you, wow. but I whether think I like. Sure. Because yeah. and because no, because you had a compelling future that your whole world was based on, and now you, win or lose, it's over. <laughs> this is what it is now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's wired into your nervous system, right? It's, who, it's your it's, identity. It's, but it's, I mean, like that's, like, that's where I'm at now because, you know, I truly believe that, you know, north of 75, 80% of athletes that come out of Olympic Games go through some kind of depression. And, and, you know, for me, honestly, during those three days where I was sitting in my room for... You know, didn't want to talk to anybody, didn't want to see anybody, wasn't eating, just sat there in solidarity. And, um, you know, for me, it, it was almost like I knew I, like, in my head I didn't want to be alive, but also, like, I, I, I thought there was another way and another route that I could take instead of taking my own life. And, and um, I was like, you know, I was like, might as well try to reach my hand out and ask for help. And I think that was the real first time that I felt comfortable asking for help because I was so vulnerable and in such a dark place. And, and um, you know, I think as athletes and especially as Americans, I feel like we always have this chip on our shoulder. We're like, oh, we're this big macho person. Like I can get through anything and just power through it and I'll be fine. But 
the dead honest truth is you can. And, and we all struggle every day in similar situations, and whether it's anxiety, depression, any other mental health disorder. And, and I think it's something that's real and that needs to be talked about more. And, and that's what something, you know, is so exciting for me to be able to open up and talk about my story because, you know, I'm alive because of it. And, yeah. and you know, I, I've been able to learn so much through this process and how to handle things differently. Um, you know, I, I think... Also, the first two days when I was in the meadows, I, I basically didn't say a single word to a single human being because I, I was like, why, like, why are they looking at me? Or was like, why am I here? It was like, blah, blah, blah. Like, all these thoughts were going through my head. And then I finally just said to myself, I was like, you know what? I'm going to be here for 45 days. I might as well just you know, bite the bullet. Let's see what can happen and give it a chance. And, and hopefully I can learn and grow from this experience. And, and you know, ever since I went through there... That was probably the first time I've re- I had a real sit down, like face to face conversation with my father in probably 15 to 20 years. And it was actually in an environment that was controlled where we couldn't like blow up and get hot headed and just explode on each other. I think that was something that was so beneficial for where our relationship has grown since then. And, and you were really surprised that he was willing to come. I didn't want to invite him. So my therapist said, invite him to family week. And I was like, why? I was like, it's just going to be another letdown that he'll give me in my life. I was like, I don't want to be let down. I don't want that fear of rejection again. I was like, why would I even waste my time in doing this? And, and my therapist said to me, he said, you know, he said, if you do and he doesn't come, you at least know where he stands. And I was like, all right, that's true. I'll give it a chance. And he came, he showed up. I was very surprised. And, and we were able to get a lot off our chest that we had you know, almost compartmentalized for 15, 20 years of, you know, just pain that we both suffered. And, and um, a lot of misperceptions. Itself. Of course, of course. Yeah. What and, was the and, biggest misperception you had about your father? And what do you think the biggest one he had about you that got cleared up? By the way, watching that him poured me into tears because seeing how much he really loved you, yeah. he wasn't able to show that yeah. before. It was I, just so moving. I think one of, the, one of the things that I learned the most is he did the best he could. And maybe he didn't know exactly what to do. And maybe he could have done things a little better. You know, we talked about things that, that frustrated me growing up where, you know, like I remember when I first set my, American re- uh, my very first American record short course and short course yards instead of Olympic size, 50 meters. Um, and it was in Baltimore and he said he was going to come and he never showed. And I, like, I brought that up. And, of course, he had an excuse. And I was like, I I don't want an excuse. I was like, I'm just telling you feelings that have been inside of me for a long time, and I have to get this off. And, and, you know, know, after sitting there for an hour going back and forth of certain things we wanted to talk about, we were able to kind of breathe and and almost feel like we had, like, 50-pound weights just taking off our our shoulders. And I was like, wow. I was like, this is an easier way of living. It's so much more simpler. It just opening up and communicating. And I make the joke that I, commu- I, I learned to communicate at 32, but I guess I'd <laughs> rather learn than never learn how to communicate. So um, it's been really, really great for our relationship to be able to have sort of ba- like talking boundaries that we use and, and when we're trying to get certain points across that um, help us have a, a, an adult conversation. Are you guys close today? Closer. Closer, yeah. Um, you know, I think it, it's still kind of in my and on my terms of how much interaction I want just because it really wasn't there for 20 plus years you know I could probably say I saw him half a dozen times in 20 years and wow. and um so you know I've I've been able to let that go and now it's just going to be on my terms to be able to build whatever relationship I want with him and and he has seen his his first grandson and he hasn't yet hasn't That's yet met beautiful. Beckett so um it's a process you know? That's wonderful. Your sister says you're a lot like your father. She said you're both, yeah, both probably. headed, you're both intense. Probably, he, he well, probably gave me a bunch of uh, good things to help me get through some of the struggles that I had in the pool and, and yeah. uh, kind of helped me get to where I was. You know, I, I, I always said I, I dreamt of having like a white picket fence with family dinners and all of us being together as a family, and I never had that. But I don't know if, you know, if I would have had it if I would have been able to have the career that I did. Um, so, you know frustrating but obviously very fortunate with how everything turned out what do you think is uh you i want to go back to bob for a second because huh. that's such an influence <laughs> on your life what's uh what do you think if you had to say three things you pulled from bob that that you'll retain the rest of your life they didn't just affect you as a swimmer they definitely affected you as a swimmer it affected your life are there two or three that have come up that stuck for you can you remember sometimes you said something where it was an aha for you and you went i think one of the cool things that he said to me as a very young kid that i trying to get back to doing now in the real world um 
Uh, he removed the word can't from my vocabulary. That's awesome. Um, and and I would How? always say it. He just wouldn't let you say it? Yeah, he, just, he, he, he basically said, he's like, if you can't do something, if you're saying you can't do something, he's like, why are you here? He's like, why are you wasting your time? Do something else. Because you've already made the decision up in your mind that you can't do it. So, you know, for me, like, that was something that, you know, kind of helped me to believe that I could do things that other people had never dreamt of or were too afraid to dream of. And, and um, you know, I think it, it's definitely helpful to me as well today with things that I'm trying to do after I'm done swimming and, and now raising two boys. Yeah. So it's, you know, I think that's just such a negative word that we can all just take out of our, our vocabulary because it's just it's disgusting. Like, it's just... I hate that word Words so much. Words create emotion, and emotion creates your life, right? That's your right. From your that's life. right. That's beautiful. What for you is, uh, you know, when you look back on this career, this extraordinary career, what are the things that stand out the most? Is it the gold medals? Is it the relationships? Is it the breakthroughs within yourself? What what stands out when you look back on this career of yours? Extraordinary. Um, what do you what do you treasure most? Well, I, I mean, I I don't know if I can fully answer that because I. I I don't know if I fully understand what's happened in my career. Many have outrun some of their goals also. It's one of the reasons I want to bring you guys. I've had that experience. And then how do you renew that hunger and so forth? And how do you find it even more fulfillment sure. this time, not sure. just more achievement this time? So, And then we were kind of looking at our lives over the next 10, 20, 30 years. I've always looked at my life in 10-year segments. Yeah. And then I woke up and I'm 58 and I'm like, you know, I did this when I was 16. I said, in my 20s, I'm going to go change anyone. I'm going to learn every skill that could help any individual. And if they're committed, I'm committed, done. In my 30s, I'm going to do that with groups. And I thought groups was like this size, you know. And then my next in my 40s, I'll do it with big groups. And in my 50s, I'll do it, you know, with companies. And in my 60s, you know, maybe I'll run for president or maybe I'll, you know, I'll start a religion. I do this crazy shit. Well, now I'm there, right? And yeah. it's like, and I got a lot of years ahead of me, hopefully, God willing. So we want to look at that. What, I mean, you're, I couldn't even imagine in my life, how old are you now? 32. 32. I couldn't imagine at 32 stopping what my life has been about. And I wanted to be a professional. I thought I was just didn't have your skill set, not even close. So I look back at the now. How do you make that transition? You're not making it yet, I see. But how do you make that transition? Maybe you can help him out. It's coming in his future. Right? You know, how do you, how do you make that transition? And what does the next 10 years look like for Michael Phelps? And and that's honestly, my, my agent gave me this. It's the same exact thing. I was I did a, I do a lot of writing and I used to do a lot more. But I was writing one time and he took my journal. And he's like, "Can I can I write something?" And I said, "Yes, yeah, sure." He said, five, ten years. Pick where do you want to be in five, ten years?" So that is now starting to come to me a little yeah. bit more and clearer than it ever has before. Um, outside of the pool, because I was always so focused on times, right? That's all I was ever focused on was trying to get that much faster. Um, so for me, it's, it's honestly just still doing stuff that I love, and that's what I'm doing today. You know, being able to openly talk about how, you know, the struggles that I've had and, and um, the struggles with depression and anxiety um, through my career and just opening up about it, because it's something that I think we, we all go through, and I think as Americans, a lot of people struggle with everything every day, and, and you know, I think just being able to help people understand that it's okay to not be okay. And, and you know, for me, if I have the chance now to, to save one life or two lives, you know, like, like you were saying downstairs, you know, like yeah. 10, 20, 50, you know, so on, so on, so on. Yeah. That's, for me, I'm happy. Like, that's bigger than winning an Olympic gold medal, to be able to help somebody make, kind of get through that struggle and, and to grow as a person. And, you know, some of the things we have going on, we have a wearable device that we're working with, um, I just finished a documentary called Angst with children talking about anxiety and depression um, awesome. that was shown uh, nationwide in schools. Um, we have a couple other things that we're working on now. We have um, a really cool one with a couple Olympians talking about depression, how basically around Stephen Holcomb and, and um, when he took his life. And, um, you know, just trying to find a way to help people when they need it. And and. It's beautiful. Um, you know, I know for me, I was somebody who never wanted to ask for help. And when I did, it was the greatest thing I ever saw. Um, so really sharing my story that way, but um, continuing to raise awareness for uh, water safety and, and um, learning, teaching kids to be water safe, I think is something that has always been a passion of mine. And as we said before, that's how I started to swim. And, and uh, our foundation is nationwide, um, scattered around the world. Uh, working with Special Olympics and uh, Boys and Girls Club, just teaching water safety because I think um, children under the, under the age of 14, drowning is the second highest cause of death, and that's something that's got to stop. So 
Uh, now as a father, um, I mean, my kids are in the pool already. They're the boomer. You can't get them out of the pool. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Big surprise. <laughs> um, but honestly, just being able to do what I love, you know, I think that's something that I, that I, I will continue to do, and, and um, it's fun. I think that's the coolest part. You know, like, that's I'm sure cool. you have a blast doing what you do. It's and, the most fulfilling thing I can imagine. You know, it's just, it's just great to be able to help, and, and I think I'm probably just scratching the surface of, of the next 20 years or 15 years of my life, but... Um, I'm enjoying the ride. I'm enjoying the process. I've been able to learn so much more, and and um, yeah, see well, where the road takes me. I love him. I'll be rooting. I'll be rooting for him in in Tokyo. Well, we all will. I'll be, be there. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs>